Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you are here today for this talk uh, from Zero to GitOps Heroes by May Large, Russ Palmer, and Priyanka Ravi. I'm Stacy Potter. I'm a community manager here at Weaveworks. If you're new, welcome. And if you've been coming to these sessions for a while, welcome back. A little bit of background on uh, the company that uh, Pinky and I work for. Uh, if this is your first time coming to one of these events that we've been running, the, the company is called Weaveworks. Um, if you haven't heard of us, we are a startup with globally distributed and remote workforce across the globe. Um, a lot of what we do is based on open source. So you may have heard of our projects Flux and Flagger, which are in the CNCF as incubating projects. And we've recently submitted for um, our application to graduate. So fingers crossed on that. Um, Flux was also the project that really kicked off the term GitOps. So it's really been cool to see lots of adopters of the project and see the community grow over the last few, few years. Um, so much so that large cloud vendors and other organizations like Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, VMware, and others have adopted it as um, and, and are using it under the hood to offer GitOps to their customers. Uh, so Cortex is a, another one of our projects uh, that is in the CNCF that helps make um, Prometheus scalable. I mentioned that because Prometheus is a part of the uh, progressive delivery possibilities with Flagger. Um, and of course, other projects like Weave Ignite, um, EKS Cuddle, and now Weave GitOps, which is also a free and open source tool that provides GitOps for your various needs and has a UI on top of Flux. Um, and we have many more, so if you're interested, definitely check us out on GitHub under Weaveworks, as well as the CNCF, where you can find our projects. And of course, we are a company that has paid products and services like Flux support. So if you're interested in learning more about these, uh, please check out the website at weave.works, or you can just reach out to me directly as well. So uh, a bit of housekeeping, uh, we've bookmarked an hour for today's session, but these sessions can last anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. We definitely have a hard stop at the hour though, so um, we, won't, we won't go past that. Um, but uh, the I think most people are familiar with Zoom these days, but I will just mention one thing that is when you are chatting, we're gonna use the chat function for questions today. And when you are chatting at us, uh, please make sure to change the two um, to everyone. And that's just so that uh, everyone here in the audience can see your comment or question. Um, and unless it's burningly private, which you can just send me a DM directly, that's fine. Um, but otherwise I will copy and paste things that I see aren't to everyone. So just be aware of that. Okay, so I will do a quick little intro if this is your first time. I want to give you some basics. If you're brand new, um, we just want to cover what is GitOps, you know, in, in general. So as the name indicates, it's Git plus Ops, or sometimes we like to say operations by pull requests, where you have a repo as your single source of truth. It's not just app dev or just operations, but really a methodology that crosses all areas. We talk about GitOpsing all the things, and the business value that comes with that are reliability, velocity, and security benefits. It's also a paradigm or a methodology. It's not one single tool or technology. Of course, we're very excited about our Flux project and we work really hard to get it to the place where we've brought GitOps value, but we're thinking about the vision of the most powerful way we can think about GitOps in the coming years and hopefully decades. And really, um, we feel like we can, even if you're not using Kubernetes, you can still do GitOps. But if you are using Kubernetes, um, it's really part of the evolution of Kubernetes, leveraging the Kubernetes API and what that brings. And we're excited to be uh, part of that community in a very deep way. Be sure to follow the um, uh, work that the GitOps working group is doing over uh, under the CNCF app delivery SIG. Their focus is to clearly define a vendor neutral principle led meaning of GitOps and establish a foundation for interoperability between tools, conformance and certification. You can find more um, on GitHub or just by visiting OpenGitOps. Uh, dot dev. Speaking of the GitOps working group, uh, these are the four principles um, as defined by that working group. And I'll run through these quickly and I won't read them all word for word. You can always check these out uh, more in depth at the website. 
So a key point I want to make here is that not everybody has all four principles. So really, wherever you start your journey is a great way to get started with GitOps. So whether you're using Git as your versioning system or not, the important thing is that you're using a versioning system. Other core principles are that you have a declarative system and that you have a way in which changes are automatically applied to that system. And then at the end, you have ways of reconciling, ensuring correctness, as well as alerts. So that is a very, very brief and quick intro of what is GitOps. But if you want to know more, please do visit the Open GitOps that have website, or you can check out our website. We've got works for more information as well. So uh, one of the stars of the show today is going to be Flux. Um, so uh, I just want to give you a little bit of information on how to get connected to the Flux community. Um, and I will paste some of these links into the chat as well. Um, so a bit on how to get connected is you can visit the website fluxcd.io to learn more. And if you make your way over to GitHub, give us a star, check us out, and um, check out the discussions. There's a great Q&A under the discussions there as well. So you can find most questions that you're likely to ask um, have an answer in, in that section. Uh, the Flux team is also, of course, on the CNCF Slack under the Flux channel. And if you need an invite, again, I'll drop all of these links into the chat in just a bit. So we do have uh, a few more events coming up for this spring slash summer session of our Weave Online user groups. Um, tomorrow, Scott Rigby is going to come back for GitOps for Helm users. And then um, my colleague Kingdon will be talking about GitOps with Flux on AKS uh, on April 7th. And then uh, we'll also have Reconcile Terraform resource resources the GitOps way, um, which will be a new talk that we haven't done before on our Weave Online user group. So be sure to check back at the end of April for that one as well. Uh, and then the Flux uh, folks will be at KubeCon, so we hope to see you there. And be sure to check out GitOpsDays.com uh, that we have scheduled right now for June. More to come on that later. Okay, so with that, we are at my time. So I will turn it over to Russ, May, and Pinky. You can all please come on and I will advance the slide for you guys. So feel free to introduce yourselves and take it away. All right, well, hello, my name is May Large and I'm a staff field engineer at VMware. And I'll pass it on to Pinky who's Dressed down today. She's so I was going to let Russ introduce himself too. <laughs> Russ, go ahead. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. Uh, I'm Russ Carver. I'm a senior technology engineer at State Farm. Um, I've been doing the GitOps enablement work for about three years now. Yeah, so I'm Priyanka Ravi. I also go by Pinky, and I am a developer experience engineer at Weaveworks. And so basically, backstory is that the three of us actually enabled GitOps at a company before this. So even though we're everywhere now, <laughs> we're going to share our experience with that. All right, let's get going. Setting the stage. So as Pinky alluded to, right, the three of us all work together. <laughs> there were ups and downs, for sure. <laughs> as the GitOps platform team in our uh, prior life. But um, that's what we're here to talk about, right? How we as a GitOps platform team in a large insurance company, and even though we all, some of us have moved on from the team, we continue to evangelize. We continue to be huge proponents of GitOps. And we're of course, we are of course still GitOps practitioners. Once a practitioner, always a practitioner. Right, And that speaks to the value that we really took from GitOps and all those principles that we continue to apply even in our new roles right now. And for me, as a staff field engineer at VMware, um, GitOps continues to be a fundamental building block as we offer a developer-friendly Kubernetes platform to our customers, primarily focusing on a secure software supply chain. But enough of what I do right now. Let's talk about what we did, right? So the GitOps part. GitOps started for us, our journey started in 2019, February of 2019, right around Pinky's birthday. I'm not gonna say what, how old she turned that, that year, but <laughs> she's totally dressed down today. I'm gonna keep highlighting that. <laughs> um, GitOps was pitched to us by a product team out in Dallas. And as soon as I, 
picked up on how is this different? Like that night at my hotel room, I was combing through WeaveWorks' Flux documentation and just really excited about, we better do this. Now is the right time. That is the spark that started with both uh, myself and Russ because we were the ones receiving the pitch. And as soon as we got back, like, let's, let's get to work. And we couldn't, couldn't wait for Pinky to relocate over to Arizona to be uh, to start contributing uh, for us with GitOps. And she ended up focusing on the Kubernetes implementation, but we'll get to this, the specifics um, as, we, as we continue on. But um, the need for a change. Well, how do, I, how do I explain this? So we enabled a way for our product teams or developers to get their code change realized through the hands of our customers. Um, but we quickly realized it's not sustainable. Um, I can get into the specifics, but clearly as we're starting to mature with infrastructure as code, there's different ways that you move over. Let's just focus on Terraform, for example. Moving over those reviewed, hardened, vested Terraform files in the so prior solution that we had wasn't going to cut it. It was not sustainable. Right, so that's that's one of the drivers for change, and not that this has not been attempted before, but we think what we knew. The nature of our target platforms as we are moving to either public cloud or even on prem, but embracing the declarative nature on how we describe code, how we realize code onto a target environment, we knew this is the right time to get get ops implemented across a large organization, okay? Um, so we understood the benefits, right? And let me just touch on some of the few. So some of those would be one, it's, it's a best friend, it's a bestie of infrastructure as code, right? Which we are getting better at. Um, and at the same time, the increased transparency is something that we were really shooting for. Um, the more that, your code, how that's realized out in any environment, you can point it back to the code or the lines of change that were updated is increased transparency, increase better visibility when it comes down to any audits that are that needed to happen. Okay. And at the same time, in every secure software supply chain, there's data points that over time as we matured, we were able to pick up on, and we'll get into the specifics later on. I don't want to jump ahead. But the most important bit for me as far as the benefit, and I remember talking about this at GitOpsCon last year. GitOps at this, at this um, organization is a result of us finally being decisive on improving the developer experience. Because we focus on developer experience, one of the many results of that is the adoption of GitOps. And I don't want to focus on just the developers because now the added perspective, now that I've moved on from that team, it's not really just the developers. There's lots of personas in every environment, right? Where GitOps is a fundamental building block. You have your security personas, right? That are involved in that, that will, that will describe policies via code realized by GitOps. You have your operators, right? From how they stand up any environment that are involved in that chain as well. And they describe that via, via code, realized again by GitOps. And I think that that's just some of the top benefits. And I'm sure as we go through the many slides that we have, well, we're not that many, but many talking points. <laughs> Russ and Finky will touch on the many other benefits of GitOps. But here's a great idea. Here's something that we, we, gotta, we gotta start working on. In a large organization, there's gonna be varying reception to a brand new idea. So I'm just gonna kind of group the reactions. I don't wanna focus on the negative, the in, internal pushback, but I mean, that's the reality. If it's a fundamental change, you are gonna get varying reactions, right? So three categories. One, from the auditors, right? Those who are put in charge to enforce or govern processes. And before I took on this role, before I thought all this change management, audit compliance were like, oh, they just need job security. I'm like, eh, that's not really, there's really no consequences. I mean, that's my naive side of 
being a developer before. But now when I took on this job or this role, I understood that there really are consequences, right? Uh, we are actually getting audited, federal folks involved. So it, it, I had to take it seriously. We all have to take it seriously and convey the why, right? And so the pushback initially proved to me that such and such and such requirements will be met. And you know how we did that? How we addressed that initial pushback is education, right? There's lots of benefits that we get from Git. Get from Git, you get it? <laughs> and so it's education us. This is how it's locked down. A commit SHA is a commit SHA. If you make subsequent changes, no, I mean, that's a totally different SHA, right? So it's about, again, the education and the collaborative features of, that we get with Git. Next. Um, next reception is um, from the first line leaders who are responsible for signing off on changes before they affect our customers. And even on that group alone, there's varying receptions as well. Some are, hmm, I don't know. I don't really use Git every day. So I'm not familiar with the workflow. I'm going to need some training, which is, that's, that's perfectly fine. That's a, that's a valid reaction. And then another, another camp that's like, I can actually see the code change. I can actually see what my developers modified. It helped me to understand what I'm actually signing off on. That's awesome, right? Again, back to the increased transparency. And of course, the last group that's like, oh my gosh, are you guys gonna make this happen? Like the developers, they're like, if you guys can get this to be a thing here in our organization, you guys are gonna be our heroes. And that's how we are right now. We are GitOps heroes. Come on, Russ. You gotta, you gotta do that. <laughs> and so we we needed to get to work, and that started with the GitOps platform team that is composed of us three. And I'm so happy to uh, reunite with Pinky and Russ in this talk. So I'm gonna turn it over to Russ because I, I think I've done enough talking. Oh, May, you're never done talking. <laughs> 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 so kind of at, at, at this point we've kind of gone through and looked at all the different documentation we've you know looked at all the different you know everything looks good on paper um but it, you know it's kind of to the point now where we kind of put a little bit of meat behind it and see if this is really going to do what we think it's going to do what it's going to be able to what it says it can do um and kind of some of the, the bullet points that we really need to hit as far as like you from uh, from a poc standpoint is Number one, ensuring that all of our you know, current change management requires are met um, and not saying that everything was kind of basically ported over and taken what was existing and just copy and pasted over this new flow and call it a day. Um, but actually getting into the point of, you know, remapping, refocusing and making sure that the key pieces that are currently required can still be met and it can be pointed to at these separate locations and maybe it's moved from a uh, from an actual, you know, change management application to get and actually using like a, like an approver set or whatever the case may be. Um, and with that, we also want to be able to support multi-cloud. Um, and so that everybody, no matter which platform you're using, it's still relatively the same flow up until like a certain point is kind of where we want it to be, where it makes it uh, deployment easier as you're going from, you know, you know, private cloud to public cloud or whatever the case may be, you can kind of move things around and the, the deployment pattern is relatively the same. Um, we have also uh, um, mentioned before a little bit like the compliance aspect of everything to make sure that it's the that things that do get to production have all the correct check marks is check marks in place. It's the right people approving it. It's the right people actually deploying it. Um, all the different pieces that kind of go along with that. Uh, security and risk. Um, really, just making sure we're not putting ourselves into a giant black box of you know who knows what. Open I can say we don't want to open up Pandora's box of change. Um, and just kind of making sure we're at least keeping everything within the rails that way. Um, and that all kind of falls under the change management aspect. Um, and that was, you know, kind of more working with the change management team with the new processes and making sure that all the different pieces kind of line up and that they were okay with what we had and what we were, what we had envisioned, made sure coincided with what they had envisioned um, and kind of going back and forth with both sides to make sure everybody was on the same page. You know, we tweaked a little bit, they tweaked a little bit. Um, to get to a platform that ultimately um, was, you know, compliant and efficient for everybody, um, which then came to the point of, you know, kind of going back to what we talked about those initial pushbacks, 
um, where we wanted to kind of convincing and demonstrating the value. You know, you, you kind of give the word out there and you get those people who are like, eh, I don't believe it till I see it. Now it's time to show it. And we can actually sit there and we can show an application deployment all the way through how it would work, how basically simplistic it was compared to other deployment patterns that we had before, how teams can use it, how things can be consumed. Um, and that's really where we started getting more of the buy-in from a lot of these different areas is when we got this initial POC. It wasn't even fully fledged out yet. It's just in the normal test sandbox environments, but it was enough to people to kind of realize like, hey, this is good. This is going to work. And this is actually what we, the, we expected a big pushback from a lot of consumers, from a lot of change management and everything else. And what we actually found out is that going through with all the POCs, a lot of these areas are actually eager for a change. They knew their process wasn't they didn't like their process, but there wasn't a better alternative. And this was kind of helping present that better alternative that um, teams were able to buy into. Um, and with that, there were, were definitely some gaps that we needed to, to fill in. Um, you know, a typical, you know, I, I would say um, the normal documented GitOps flows, you know, show kind of like happy path and everything else, but don't look as much as some of the compliance pieces and some of the different um, things that go along with that. So we kind of had to fill in the gaps with our own we created our own API to make it easier to integrate with some of the different connection points that we needed. Um, you know, we, rather than having the consumer worry about having to call eight different pieces to get all the stuff that needed to happen, we were just kind of like, well, let's make a single API that's just gonna handle it all. Um, we also created like our own CLI, um, just then more of a convenience sake so that uh, consumers would have all the commands they need to do in one location and one tool and not have to worry about trying to hit curl one endpoint or call their a private CLI for another, whatever the case may be, just more of a, Again, that was more of a consumer enablement aspect of things. Um, and then the biggest piece that came into was actually the config repo setup itself. And that ended up being where a lot of the change management requirements and enforcement stuff actually got baked into. Um, we actually leveraged Terraform to make repeatable, um, enforceable modules that, that way teams didn't have to worry about making sure that this branch was protected and this branch wasn't protected and this set of approvers is in here and this these people have maintainer access and these people have dev access whatever the case may be the module just handles all of that for them and so which made it also easy for for us is change management requirements sometimes change um you know tools that are used for it change requirements change we could easily just tweak that on the back end um, within the module and consumers just automatically be compliant without having to actually change anything themselves um, so that was um out of the poc Kind of filled it and that paved the way for everything especially for our multi-tenancy migration so i will hand it over to pinky yeah so i think i mentioned that our first platform was aws that we actually um, enabled through GitOps, and then the next piece we tackled was kubernetes and that was something we'd actually been having discussions about for a while the real like um like fire i guess that like started us doing this is that um, change management came to us and was like, so we put off auditing Kubernetes for a while, but <laughs> like next year they're going to audit Kubernetes and we will fail because we didn't have a way to actually change manage anything into production in, in our production cluster in Kubernetes. And because everybody had admin access into their Kubernetes namespaces. So, you know, there was no lockdown there. So we knew that this was something we had to do. So there was a lot of conversations with the Kubernetes platform team. And the thing is the Kubernetes platform team had been around for like, I think a few years before this, maybe a couple of years before we started having these discussions, they were already established. They had their ways of onboarding new people um, onto namespaces, everything already like flushed out. And, you know, most of them were not software developers. They were just strictly, you know, like a platform team, um, cluster operators. So for a lot of it, it was a kind of a, I, would, I wouldn't say like a language barrier, but, it, but like there was a lot of, you know, um, back and forth on trying to get on the same page about the whole thing, because we knew that we like by going to multi-tenancy with Flux, we would actually be able to do everything with the declarative nature, let Flux control everything. Um, there's a lot of benefits to going this route. Um, and such as like, you know, you don't have to actually go and like do cube control commands to see what's out in the cluster. You can just go see um, like in the multi-tenancy repo. Another thing is the way that they were doing it before is they were calling off to APIs that they had created um, that would call off to the cluster APIs. And then they would also um, 
have like a database in the background, but the database wasn't actually getting updated when a namespace was being deleted. There was a whole lot of other things like that. So this was going to solve a lot of issues. Basically, the way we kind of got them on, on board is basically also doing what Russ was saying, a lot of POCs, you know, just showing them there was a lot of work that we did with like sandbox clusters to show them that this is possible. And look, it's not going to ruin everything you already have. It's going to actually be really nice because you can just go change resources on the fly. Like, let's say someone needs more um, CPU or whatever they need, right? They need to update their limits, then they can actually just do it within the YAMLs. It's a lot easier. And so basically, um, we collaborated a lot with them. And then we also uh, um, started out with actually Flux One. This was a while back. And we actually made it so that everyone already had a Flux um, instance in their namespace so that they didn't actually need prod access to the cluster anymore. They could just um, connect that Flux instance to whatever they needed, whatever repo they needed, right? And then um, after that, after a while, we actually, um, started working on the migration to Flux 2. There were long early morning meetings <laughs> with the three of us where we were kind of just going through the docs and learning it and then uh, just doing a lot of POCs in that way as well. And then we also were really lucky to do a workshop with the WeaveWorks team. And that is an option if anyone is already on Flux 1 and they're trying to get onto Flux 2. Um, WeaveWorks does op offer like a workshop to kind of get you situated if the need arises. So you can contact us for that. And then um, a big thing, and I think May hit on this in her slide too, like the, a big thing of our success, I feel like was education and also evangelizing the whole GitOps process. So the reason it's super critical is because, you know, we can create this fantastic process, but it's not going to go anywhere if nobody knows how to use it or nobody even knows about it, right? They're still using the old way. And so we did a lot of um, presentations within our own internal roadshows, we piggybacked off of some other internal um, conferences and stuff. And then we also did a um, roadshow for our Kubernetes setup. And then, um, well, yeah, so the onboarding process, we, since because we had created such a like a custom onboarding process, we really needed to create like also get out there and tell people how to use it. And then also we actually did a lot of external stuff as well. We um, went to several conferences. We did, um, I think we presented at like ADDO, All Day DevOps, and then we presented at HashiConf, um, GitOps, <laughs> GitOps Days, and uh, GitOpsCon as well. So we wanted to, we knew that we had kind of come up with like a special process or something, you know, that was kind of unique. And we really wanted to share with other people. And that way um, they could maybe take inspiration or, you know, use kind of our, the pattern that we'd already established and then go from there as well. So, oh, and then now I'm gonna pass it off to May. Thank you, Pinky. Are you sure you wanna pass it on to me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a jump. Oh, we're talking about operations. So we got GitOps enabled in all our strategic platforms, right? Um, and Russ touched on the GitOps solution stack, right? Some are homegrown, some are obviously open source, like Flux, a, a major building block in the entire solution. Uh, we have a footprint with Terraform, right? We provided modules for config repos, right? So as we matured with what we enabled, right, it became a given that each of the pieces that make up the GitOps solution stack should come with uh, metrics and observability. And that's really as simple as Prometheus and Grafana and alerting when we need to take action on all those pieces. That became an expectation, right? And, but beyond that, right? The pieces that we own and maintain and provide, right? Now we then focus on how do we surface this value that our customers get from GitOps um, over to them, whoever wants to understand the data. So yes, yes, Terraform modules, yes. Uh, for, for standing up and reinforcing uh, config repos. But anyhow, let's talk about the, the metrics, right? What, what are those metrics that we were so excited about? So with the adoption of GitOps, we were able to help other causes within that organization to actually um, get nudged or get pushed along. Example would be migration from one CI CD solution over to the other, specifically from Jenkins to GitLab. Right, And because we are in charge of the end-to-end -end, um, realizing your secure software supply chain, right? we are able to capture data points 
as your code change is progressing through until it's realized to the hands of our customers, okay? So we came up with another homegrown solution. It's not, it's not our team. It's another team within our, our suite that took care of that, but we're able to harvest that and come up with the top three that we were excited about. One is deployment events, like how many product teams are using GitOps, how frequent, and what target platforms, what target cloud provider are they applying their products onto, okay? Realizing that this organization is multi-cloud. And GitOps, as a matter of fact, right, the solution stack behind GitOps is multi-cloud, right? We have our, some of our pieces running in AWS and some of the pieces running in our on-prem Kubernetes cluster. The next is change lead time. And this is, it's, it's key, right, in telling the story on how did it, did it, did GitOps really make a difference, right? And to me, getting this metric is super important. This is the start of more metrics that we can provide from an SRE perspective, recovery, all the MTTs that you can think of, right? Change lead time. From the moment, Pinky, let's use Pinky because she's dressed down today. The moment Pinky pushed her code change remotely till the time that it's, let's just, let's just stick to Kubernetes, till the time that Flux picks that up, right? And we know that Flux is going to apply it to your target cluster. That is the change lead time that we're able to report on. And last and certainly not the least, another thing that I'm excited about, right? GitOps is about, at least for us, is small, small miniature changes going straight to production, less context switching. And that's why we're huge proponents of fixing forward. Because if all you change is this one particular task or user story, right? If that causes problems, you should be able to, like that's, that's, that's it, that's all you change. That's easily fixable. As opposed to compounding, right? Release train bulk changes over to your customers. So change size is really about um, how many files did you change and how many lines within each of those files got changed. Again, promoting the small miniature changes getting straight to production. And last but not least, I'm gonna move on to governance, right? We're regulated, we have compliance requirements. And as our customers become more and more familiar with how to use specifically our config repos, right? And as they become more savvy with infrastructure as code, which is awesome, right? It's showing the maturity of our consumers as well. There had been times where the curves and the boundaries have been breached. But because we have those data points, right, we're able to now take that and reinforce it in such a way that if there is, I mean, bottom line, if there is a non first line leader, a manager who's not supposed, someone who's not the manager in charge of a product approves a merge request affecting production. That's an immediate alert. We're gonna lock down the entire building. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's an immediate alert to the necessary stakeholders that such and such, it gets escalated, right? It's an immediate alert that you circumvented um, our change management process. So, and there's more, I'm sure that it's getting added, but we've moved on from the team, but maybe Russ could share more. So, <laughs> I'll turn it over to Russ because he loves this next topic. Oh, my favorite. Um, so <laughs> kind of comes down to, you know, after, you know, through the initial POC, through all the matrix, the metrics and governance and everything else that we got on here, kind of got into more of like the, the hardening phase uh, of GetOps. And this is just um, <laughs> specifically when it comes down to like credential management, which um, I think GetOps, I think it's probably one of the biggest I wouldn't call it issues, but the biggest holes that like a lot of teams are addressing is how do you handle credentials? Not, not just from runtime application credentials, but actually deployment credentials and how you're gonna get everything moved from A to B um, in a secure manner. Um, and so that involved kind of collaboration with not only coming up with, okay, how are we gonna come up with solid credential management, but actually working with other, some of the platform areas to actually enable tools 
to make it easier to do secure coding practices, whether that be setting up, you know, um, the like vault, like vault sidecars and Kubernetes or the CSI driver or, you know, integration into, um, you know, the external secrets provider, whatever the case may be, getting a way that teams could actually get those runtime credentials into their application without having to commit them to a, to a project or without having to go in and actually create a secret directly on like a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, Cause there's, you know, some areas where you can't do that in prod. Um, you could may potentially read, but you can't write. So like, how are you gonna avoid those goals or avoid those issues? Um, and that is actually still an ongoing process. It's one of those things they always, uh, like I said, I feel like it'll be like kind of a never ending process, but <laughs> it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's evolving to get more and more secure. Um, but um, it may have mentioned before too about, you know, our customers getting more comfortable with infrastructure as code and defining all their code what, as YAML or Terraform or whatever the case may be, cloud, uh, cloud formation. Um, now trying to get into the embracing the more of the policy as code and getting to the point of looking, you know, what OPA policies or Sentinel policies or vault policies, whatever the case may be, getting actually into, the, into that nature of defining Every, basically everything is code, <laughs> but next iteration was kind of like infrastructure first, kind of looking at the policy as code as well. Um, and so that you can kind of even help, one, it's repeatable um, and it makes it very easy to, for recovery or in even to, uh, as you onboard new, you know, teams have turnover, as you bring on new team members, they can very easily see exactly what's already there, what there's issues with some of the policies as well. And you can set the policies up to kind of help keep your develop your teams within their own but basically protect them from themselves um and make sure that they you know whether intentionally or unintentionally they're not exposing anything that they shouldn't be so that'll bring us to thank you um this is kind of like a little bit like our last slide that we've got here so this is kind of like the whole flow was talking about some of this is lessons that we learned along the way some of this is hey it's vice if you're starting now you might want to do some stuff different than what we did, to be, to be honest with you. Um, the, the very, very first point I want to point out here is the community involvement. Um, when the three of us kind of started down this venture, it was kind of like, let's look at the docs, let's look and see what we need. And we just hit strong basically in our own little box and just went through and tried to make solve all the problems that we can. Um, it wasn't until probably the end of our initial probably flux one journey that we actually kind of reached out to the community and actually um, reached out to, um, you know, some folks at, at Weave to come and actually, you know, do a little working session with us. And when we realized that, we found out that one, luckily we did most of the stuff um, right. <laughs> but we also found that the, some of the stuff that we were having a really hard time solving um, had already been solved by some other consumers. And we probably would have saved six months, probably of the initial deploy time, just kind of going through looking at some of the pieces. So, um, you know, reach out to those resources um, to, um, you know, give as much help because more than likely problems you're going to be facing, you're not alone. Um, and there's going to be an answer some way out, out there that maybe might work or you might be able to take at least tweak um, off of there to help uh, solve your problem. Uh, the other thing is be patient. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, this is not something that's going to happen in one PI session or one sprint or anything like that. Um, you know, unless you are in a company of like 10 people, this is probably going to take months, years, depending on the size of the organization. Um, the benefits part far outweigh the cons, um, I think, and that's a big thing that we've seen as well. Um, the general consensus we've got from consumers is that they really enjoy the new process. And the most common feedback we get is, that's it. <laughs> when they go through to set everything up, they're expecting this big, long, convoluted process. And it's as simple and as easy as moving, uh, just using Git. Um, so the, the feedback has been extremely positive from consumers. Um, having a dedicated team, um, especially for large organizations or anything else, having a team that kind of help kind of hit the next point where we're uh, standardizing um, you know, best practices just just to keep everybody within the guide rails because otherwise you're going to have if you have 10 teams then trying to enable 10 um you know enable get ops themselves you're going to have 10 different patterns to find and if anything has to change it's going to be extremely hard to get everything to go through and as one team moves to another team you're going to have one team doing get ops one way and another team doing get ops another way 
Um, just having that team to kind of set up all the standards, set up all those best practices, handle any of the changes that need to happen is going to help at least keep everything steering in the same direction. Um, not everybody is going to might agree with some of the directions that are made, but you can always open it up for conversation to see if there's change, tweaks that need to happen. Or you can always just say like, these were these decisions were made because of X, Y, and Z type of deal. Um, but you don't want to have a, just a big get up sprawl within your organization. Um, the other big thing is that, you know, keep in mind outages do happen. Um, the biggest one that we saw still kind of working with is we ran into an issue with flux one, not flux two, but flux one, uh, where get deploy secrets were magically disappearing. Um, and we can't, we have not been able to figure out why, uh, don't know if it was our, something with the setup, if it was something on the, maybe the consumers, maybe we're doing something, to our best knowledge, it seemed that some of the annotations kind of got wonky and the secret got cleared. Don't know. It's not a widespread problem. It's not something that hit the entire cluster. It's something that just seems to pop up every now and then. Um, we've had teams that have been using it for well over a year without a single problem. There's been other teams that reported it got dropped twice in a month. And it's, it's super sporadic. Um, more of the story on that. Uh, if you're just starting out, use Flux 2. Um, <laughs> um, and don't worry about Flux 1. I was going to say use Flux 2 anyway, because Flux 1 is going to stop having support. <laughs> so. Yes. yes. <laughs> and Flux 2 comes with out of the box um, alerting Prometheus and Grafana as well, which is awesome, right? Um, yes. You get that for free. Yes. We loved that. We had so much fun with that. <laughs> You didn't have it in your lessons learned, Russ. We should have added it, like uh, having a GitOps t-shirt. Oh yeah, having someone um, design a little like logo for <laughs> internally within your company. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Any non-Kubernetes GitOps uses. Yeah, so um, like I was saying, Actually, the first platform that we enabled, we actually enabled it for three different platforms within the company. Sorry. Uh, yeah, three. <laughs> and so the first one was actually AWS because it was kind of like new to the company and like becoming the direction that they were pointing us in. And there wasn't like a really great established way of getting code to production. So that was the first one we tackled. And then we did Kubernetes and then we did um, Pivotal, Cloud Foundry. So... That was the third one we did. Custom I, also noticed, I also noticed, um, yeah, so Darwin was was asking about the Terraform yeah. modules earlier. Do you guys want to speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, we, we could talk about them, but they're not public. They're, yeah. they're, 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 they're internal homegrown ones that we use specifically for um, for our own stand up. And then the um, we, we have our own hosted Git solution um, that's not on the, on, the, uh, on the interwebs either. Um, <laughs> But, but essentially what the, what the module would do would be to stand up the repo um, and then add um, all the different compliance pieces. Like we, we knew that with anything that got stood up on there, um, we didn't want people to be able to go in and just hit the merge buttons. We would go in and we would set, we would programmatically set all the correct user accesses. And if users were not uh, allowed to be in like an owner role, they would be removed from that owner role. Um, and so we, we, there would be ways where like, you know, if a manager wanted to go in and add a developer, they'd get taken back out. Um, and Terraform was really a, a handy way of, of doing that because it has that, you know, you know, set state and different features to it. And it has all the, um, you know, module providers for, you know, for Git, you know, GitLab, GitHub, Git, you know, AWS. Um, I was like, what else did AWS, Vault? I mean, you can, everything you want to do, you can do it in, um, with there and so for the for like those for those enabling it just made it much easier and the code behind it is actually fairly complex and that's when we realized that there's no way a consumer is really going to be able to go through and check all 12 of these boxes um to make and sure everything is working <laughs> and let's not forget our favorite custom adder and that's oh, how we yeah. do that's a yeah. good one it's our favorite so we were specifically because, using GitLab. So, so custom adder, it, 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 no matter what implementation, right? We needed a way to differentiate config repos, right? Because those you shouldn't jack with, right? We, 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 are, we are letting product teams, development teams to continue whatever practices, branching strategy they have. We're not going to interfere with that. 
But the config repo, right? That's what's getting realized to production. We needed a way to differentiate those and custom adder being an admin level type determination, right? It's hidden from our customers, but we're able to right distinguish which ones do we reinforce on a regular basis. That's I think that's my favorite from the module. <laughs> Is that? <laughs> I'm trying to think if I have a favorite in the module. <laughs> well, I, 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 like my favorite part about the modules is that it helped me learn Terraform. Cause I think that was like the first thing they put on me when I joined the team, they were like, here, go create these Terraform things. And I was like, I don't know Terraform. <laughs> I just got okay. married. <laughs> and you want me to learn Terraform? <laughs> um. So I just want to throw it out there to the audience. Um, I think thank you all for this wonderful presentation and taking the time and coming to speak to us. But I want to throw it out to everyone out there. Like these are three people who work together to implement and build a whole GitOps process within a company. This is your chance to pick their brains um, in in a very selective way here with you know a kind of semi private audience. So if uh, if you have any questions that you're you know or, or anything that you're struggling with, please ask now. Um, you know they're here to answer your questions, so please put them in the in in the in the chat, um, and we'll tackle them as they come in. So um, I like that question. Darwin is asking choices. Yeah, yeah. Help templates in GitOps versus bare YAMLs and customization. <laughs> Depends, right? We did both. Um, we had certain cases where we were doing Helm charts. We were doing like the Helm releases with Flux. But I mean, there's also obviously reasons to have bare YAMLs as well, I think. Wouldn't y'all agree? Yeah. Um, but Flux makes it really easy, I think, to use Helm. Like super simple. You just have to create a Helm release, basically. Um, I mean, and I will just throw that out that yeah. Scott Rigby, who is a flux maintainer yeah, yeah. and Helm maintainer, yeah. tomorrow will be doing a whole se session on Flux's Helm controller. So yeah. if if you do want to learn more about that, join us tomorrow because he'll be here for that. And he is actually a um just a heads up, he's actually a Helm uh contributor, a maintainer. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't think of the word. He's a Helm maintainer. So like he's definitely a great person to like come listen to for that topic. Well, I will, uh, so someone is also asking, what are the details for the event tomorrow? I will follow up in an email. I will also drop them into the chat here as well. Um, Aaron is also asking, any advice on how to structure your Flux oh, repository? This is funny, but we can definitely give our advice too. But uh, Scott and I are actually going to be doing a presentation in a couple of weeks, it sounds like, about that. Um, but I mean, like, I would be curious, what do y'all think about how you should structure your Flux repository? I, I mean, I got my opinion. I would recommend the, the way I, I recommend structuring the stuff would be like essentially one repo per application. Um, and then everything kind of goes along with it there. So if you've got, if you're going to Kubernetes um, and you want to deploy your, um, your, your API, you would put, you know, your service count YAML, your deployment YAML, your ingress YAML, your service YAML, your, you know, config map, whatever, whatever needs to happen to everything that's related to that particular deployment within that one particular project um, and then do that for everything else, whether that, you know, that's, you know, Kubernetes, if it's, you know, another project for all your, you know, Terraform deployments, whatever the case may be, breaking it down just because it makes it easier to keep the history clean, at least your, your Git history. If you go over and look at it, you can see exactly what's happening with that particular app deployment versus if you kind of blend it, you can do like a directory structure in there too. Um, it kind of becomes a little bit harder. You basically have to parse through the history to make sure you're looking at the change for the right piece. Not that it's impossible, but um, I just, I found it easier to look at the, when just trying to find out if something goes wrong, where the breaking point was, doing that, that yeah, approach. Definitely. Yeah. And a lot of it's driven by access, right? No matter, a, a main contributor to how you structure your repositories, whether it's one repo or a group of repositories, who should have access to it, right? But the beauty of Flux too, specifically, is it doesn't matter, right? You can read from Git, but the way before, but you can't affect your target environment until you bring in your customization that targets specific paths, tag, branches. It does, it, yeah. I love it, right? Because it gives you all the options, all the possibilities are there. It's mm -hmm. super flexible. So as far as choices, yes, there are choices, lots of choices. But I always recommend you start simple, right? 
And only when there's a problem that you have to address, do you then deviate from the best practice or from the standard. So Mariano is asking, what about non-Kubernetes, VMs, Terraform, et cetera? So just a heads up, um, not, not about the non-Kubernetes part, but there is actually a Terraform controller coming to Flux, which we're very excited about. It's already, I mean, it's not just coming to Flux, it's there, but, <laughs> but we're very excited about it. Um, someone on our team actually, Stacy and I's team actually created it, which is really exciting for us. I and pasted so it in the chat uh, as cool. a GitHub yeah, for great. folks. So, so that's an option. I'll up in the email as well. So um, we actually, in our past, we've, you know, a large organization <laughs> we can afford, I guess, so things like DFE. So we were actually using um, Terraform Enterprise for our AWS setup um, because then you can actually have it listening to um, uh, your your repo is the same way you can have like set up the VCS integration and have it listening for any change that's made to the repo and it'll automatically do a Terraform plan and apply. So that's kind of how we did that. VMs. Um, <laughs> VMs, we haven't, we haven't really touched no, VMs yet. That was, that's a, that's a gap that, I mean, it's on kind of on the radar, but the, there's other kind of targeting platforms, strategic platforms of choice, if you will, kind of like where the, where is the majority of our consumers at? And most of them were actually not using direct VMs. So we kind of, uh, that's on the backlog, but not addressed totally yet. Um, same patterns and stuff could apply though. It's just a matter of what is it you need to actually connect to? Do you need to, could you use something like Terraform to stand up your VMs? Are you talking about you actually have your VMs provisioned and you need to you know, like SSH into them to deploy? Um, you can still define those patterns, you know, using different, you know, potentially pipelining tools, um, to, to make it happen, but we, it's just not something that we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about, but haven't actually put anything to paper yet. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, so a couple of other things that have come in, we still have a few minutes left. Uh, so Darwin is asking choices. Single application with 60 microservices, mono repository for all clusters or separate repositories for each cluster and worry about duplication. So I don't know if I think that he might've asked of, that before, maybe Russ went into his little thing about it. But right, <laughs> so that you, you've sort of already yeah, talked. Russ kind of talked about it, I think, yeah, a little yeah, bit. I got his it. opinions on like Russ. And, and you're really trading pros and cons, right? With a mono repo, you just have to worry about the mono repo, but then you lose the flexibility. Mm -hmm. But as you propagate that to multiple repos, then right one change that would need to then be merged over to subsequent repositories, right? As you're doing environment promotion, so every option comes with pros and cons. Sorry right. to be mis yeah. Mrs. Obvious, but right, <laughs> and do start simple. Always start simple and only make a change when it's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. And I'll even go to that. There's actually I, I'd say there's even points where there's a, uh, where each of those points is valid. Like where you might want to use a single application or you might want to use a monorepo approach. Yeah. It just kind of depends on what it is you're doing, what the use case is. And like I said, what, what it is you're trying to achieve? And you just kind of figure out the pros and cons to make it happen through there. So Varun is also uh, commenting something like releases slash patch versioning being controlled here or governed or automated, or it mm -hmm. lies still with devs that want to release. Yeah, that's a good question. I think we didn't actually control that. We we highly recommended, obviously, that you do versioning and all these things, but we kind of left it up to the teams on the, the source control repo, side. In the config repo, yeah. though, we, we had our, our definite yeah, yeah. opinion, right? Um, protected yeah. branches, no one's allowed to merge. Yeah. So we we tell you how, how it's going to be in the, in the config repo. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but then you also tell us, right. If that's not working. And I know Russ for a fact has come up with permutations of the same config repo module to accommodate valid situations. Mm -hmm. You want to talk yeah, about, but we didn't valid? control like any <laughs> patterns on their source control repo. So like whatever they were doing on their source control repo versioning, whatever, that was kind of on them, like whatever tests they want to run. Um, obviously we had like recommendations and like strong recommendations, but you know, it was at the end of the day, it's like whatever that team had decided to do with their manager and everything. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, it looks like that is the end of the questions that we had. Um, real quick. I just want to ask you guys, 
uh, I have the best way to, that people can get in touch with you. I'm assuming that you guys are all on some version of Slack, uh, whatever workspace that might be. But um, may I put your Twitter handle here? Pinky, I put your Twitter Twitter handle here. Russ, I don't think you're on Twitter, so I didn't include your Twitter handle because you don't all exist on there. This but actually, right? <laughs> Let me put Russ's yeah, phone number on the chat real quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll there just, you go. I'll just drop Russ's number. <laughs> in Russ's show. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if, if, I th I think you're all on CNCF Slack. Yes, but yes. if you guys are, are there, I think you know your everyone can find you by your name. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for sharing your, your story today. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, really like this was amazing. And I hope everyone in the audience got such good value out of this. I thought it was super awesome. So really appreciate you all taking the time. Thank you for having us. Yes, yeah, thank you. Give us a chance to like hang out again, which is so exciting. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. We'll Thanks we'll everybody. Next time. So we'll make sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Be sure. Yeah, <laughs> have fun out there. And uh, thanks everybody in the audience for joining us and we will see you all next time. Thank you all. Bye, Bye. thank Take you. Care. <laughs>